you your evangelist, my dad, Jimmy Swaggart. Well, hallelujah. Give the Lord a hand. Jesus is his mighty, his holy, his wondrous, his glorious name. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord. I was sinking so very deep in so much sin. Far from that peaceful shore, so very deeply stained within. Sinking to rise no more. But the master of the sea heard my despair. Yes, he did. And from those waters, well, he lifted even me. Sing that last line with me now. Now, how sad. Every once in a while, the church forgets that its primary ministry is love. I want to say it again. I want you to listen very carefully to me. We get so carried away with our own importance and with our theology and our dogmas and creeds and doctrines and liturgies and We forget the reason why we're here. I want you to listen to me carefully. The only way in the world that God can love mankind is through man. God's not down here except in the power of the Holy Spirit. Jesus no longer walks the sandy shores of Galilee. We are his hand extended. I was in a place not long ago that could be called a living hell. It hadn't rained in some parts of that country for three years. Not a green thing to be seen. Nothing but thorn trees that grew little children that their little legs would not be any bigger than my two fingers. I stood them before me, some of them, their little ebony skin shining, stomach extended from starvation and parasites. And I looked into their eyes, glazed from weakness and malnutrition, knowing that some of them could not live. When our plane left, I looked back at the missionary there that had been there five years in that hell. And I said, God, do I really love Jesus as much as he does? I wonder. But that's what God is all about. It's not in confessing diamond rings and mink coats and Cadillacs and Mercedes Benz 
and fat bank rolls. God forbid that is hellish. But it is reaching out with a hand to those that need help and lifting them up. That's what God is. I was sinking so very deep in sin far from that peaceful shore so very deeply staying within sinking to rise never more but the master of that old raging sea. Well, yes, he heard my despairing cry. Yes, he did. And from, from those waters, well, he lived there. Everybody sing it, everybody now. Well,
hands and praise him and worship him and adore him. Just glorify his mighty name, his holy name, his precious name. Praise that holy name of Jesus. Glory be to God. Hallelujah to the Lamb. Praise the name of Jesus. Worship him, glorify him, praise him and adore him. Precious is his precious blood. Precious is his holy name. Glorious is his mighty name. Wonderful is his mighty name. Blessed is his holy name. Mighty is his name. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah to the Lamb. Glory be to God. Praise the holy name of Jesus. Praise him, O ye saints of the living God. Glorify him that is worthy of all praise and worthy of all adoration. For he is thy God thy pillar and thy strength and thy high tower and an ever-present help in time of trouble. Blessed be his holy name. Praise the name of Jesus. Glory to God. I feel led of the Lord to do this. I want John to sing one verse in chorus of Balm of Gilead. I want you to believe the Lord for healing right this moment all over this building. There be those of you that watch us for television. I want you to believe God for healing. He's the healer. He loves you. Even if you aren't saved, I want you to believe him right now. There is a lady that's in a hotel room here in town. She's only 34 years old, dying with a brain tumor. Let's believe God together for his healing virtue. She's been in tremendous pain this afternoon to go into that physical frame he's able to heal that tumor and as John sings it reach out for your healing and believe God sometimes the way is weary just don't understand so I turn my eyes on Jesus and he Help us to take you, Lord, by the hand. Me by the hand. Jesus takes Hallelujah. me by audience, Lord, flow through it. For there's a oh, oh, Jesus, oh, Jesus, oh, Jesus. In Thank God it is. Hallelujah. Just raise your hands and believe him for healing. Believe for that woman in that hotel room right now to make the wounded whole. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. 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 Jesus, heal tonight. Heal tonight. Will thy mighty power flow through this audience? Glory be to the Lamb. Hallelujah. Move, dear God.
Oh dear God. Oh dear God. <laughs> Move across this audience. Move across the hearts of these people. Touch that one that desperately needs thy healing hand. Move in that hotel room tonight. Touch that brain tumor and heal it for thy glory. We ask it in Jesus' name. Heal that one that stands here tonight and desperately needs it. We ask it in thy holy sweet name. The name of Jesus, amen. I want you all over this building to just take your time and something about Christianity that speaks of fellowship. Don't get in a hurry. We're not stuffy around here, and it's impossible to find a stuffy Hawaiian anyway. They don't exist. And I want you to hug some necks and, and shake some folks' hands and tell them you're glad they're here tonight and just give them the biggest smile you've got. Will you do it all over the building? Well, when we all, when we all get to heaven, what a day of joy Blessed be the holy name of Jesus. You may be seated. I can tell we're going to have a time tonight. Old-fashioned, heartfelt, Holy Ghost, heaven-sent, devil-chasing, sin-killing, true, blue, red-hot. <laughs> this is Gabriel. Are you going to blow him a kiss? Yeah. Okay, go ahead and do it then. A big one, a big one. Real slow, do it real slow. That's good. Now you're going to wave at him? Oh, that's great, that's great. This is Gabriel. He's a little bit over two years old, and uh, uh, you can tell that his grandmother and myself are zonked out on him. Will you go get your baby brother? Go get your baby brother. Hurry, go get him. He's asleep? He's asleep. Oh, I, well, could you get your big sister? 
No, she's, she's not coming either. Well, you're the only one that represents the crew tonight, huh? Well, tell them bye-bye. Well, them, them. Okay. I know, I know that most of you couldn't care less about that, but you wait. You just, younger ones, you just wait. You just wait. You just wait. You'll suddenly find out that those young ones are the sweetest, prettiest things in a whole wide world. I think one of the greatest songs that ever, that has come out of the great charismatic move in these last few years is this one that is really the theme song now of our telecast. You can never really know what it is. to praise God and to love Him, to know how to worship Him except through the Holy Spirit. It's just no other way. Sometimes hallelujah Sometimes praise the Lord Sometimes gentle Singing, hearts in one accord. Oh, let us lift our voices, look toward the sky and start to sing. Let us now return. Our Lord, Lord, just let our voices start to ring. Let us feel His tender presence. Let the sound of praises fill the air. Let us sing the song of Jesus' love to people everywhere. Sometimes hallelujah, sometimes praise the Lord. Sometimes gently sing, yes, Jesus, our hearts in one accord. Let our joy be unconfined. Let us sing with freedom, unrestrained. Let us take this feeling that we're feeling right now outside these walls and let it ring. Let thy spirit overflow, yes, Jesus. Lord, we are filled from head to toe. Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. I want the whole wide world to know. Sometimes, Hallelujah. Sometimes, praise the Lord. Sometimes gently sing Our hearts in one accord Sometimes
in one, one Praise the Lord. I want to ask Jonathan Wells to sing a song that, oh, I, I love it because it says something in my soul.
message that I have been attempting to bring to you, I think Karen epitomizes it exactly as it ought to be. Holy Spirit, touch through me, ladies and gentlemen, Karen Wheaton.
praise the Lord. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Just slip up your hands and praise him a moment and worship him. Just adore him, the King of kings, the Lord of lords. Flow through me. Flow through me, Holy Spirit. Flow through me. Praise the holy name of Jesus. Glory be to the Christ. Nothing's changed and nothing's new. Please, Lord, I'm not seeking a gift or some emotional lift, but there's one thing I'm longing to do. I just want to lift up my cup. Somehow, Lord, please fill it up with more of you.
of things I've had at my fill and yet I hunger oh Lord I hunger still empty and bare Lord hear my prayer oh Lord I empty and bare Praise the Lord. Thank God Jesus made a believer out of me. Let's hear it, ladies and gentlemen, John Stark.
Jesus made a believer out of me, oh, praise his name. Since he shone his light of love on me, I've never, never been the same. Don't you know that it changed my life completely? And then he made it over a new. And if you alone and let him, you'll make a believer out of you. A Jesus Say, praise the Lord. Say, hallelujah. My, my, my. <laughs> Don't you know the devil just sulks after something like that? God's not dead. He's alive. Jesus Christ is still the same yesterday, today, and forever. Hallelujah. My. <laughs> oh, boy. Just give me a moment to calm down. <laughs> Praise the name of Jesus. Glory to God. Mm. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Aren't you glad you're a Christian? Aren't you glad you're saved? Aren't you glad you know the Redeemer? Jesus made a believer out of me. If you have your Bibles with you tonight, Please turn with me to the book of St. John. I'm reading from the 13th chapter. This is at the Last Supper, hours before the crucifixion of the Master. As we minister tonight, please, unless it's absolutely imperative, please do not be getting up and walking around. If mothers have to take out children, we understand that. That's perfectly permissible. But otherwise, please understand, this message tonight possibly 
could be the only thing standing in between millions of people that will see it by television a little later. And I want you to be believing God with me for this which I believe the Lord has given me. St. John 13, 26, Jesus answered, He it is to whom I shall give a sop when I have dipped it. Pictured in your mind, they are seated on the floor in the Eastern culture of 2,000 years ago, sort of reclining on a couch type of arrangement. Judas is seated very close to him. It was a sign of tremendous friendship. He it is to whom I shall give a sop when I have dipped it, and when he had dipped the sop, he gave it to Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon. The word Judas is the Greek derivative for Judah. The Hebrew, Judas' name as Jesus knew it was Judah. Judah named after the great tribe of Judah from whom the Messiah, from which the Messiah would come. He gave it to Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon, and after the sop, Satan entered into him. Then said Jesus unto him, That thou doest, do quickly. It was so secretive, the other disciples did not really know what was happening. Now no man at the table knew for what intent he spake this unto him. For some of them thought because Judas had the bag that Jesus had said unto him, and that meant the treasury bag where their money was kept to buy groceries, food, things that was needed by the apostles. For some of them thought because Judas had the bag that Jesus had said unto him, buy those things that we have need of against the feast, or that he should give something to the poor. He then, having received the sop, went immediately out, and it was night. I want to use for the subject tonight, preaching a few minutes, taken from that last passage, and it was night. Would you bow your heads, please? Heavenly Father, I thank you that through the ministry of music you have touched and blessed and helped and strengthened these, thy children, and through television lifted that one up that needs the touch of thy healing hand. Now as we minister, we stand at the very place that the Master stood not worthy to even stand in his shadow. But so many are like Judas at the threshold of eternity. It is night. I ask thine anointing not only upon us, but upon they that would hear and listen and receive. And I will ask it all in Jesus' name. And everyone said amen and amen. I had one of the most unusual experiences a few weeks ago, I guess, that I've ever had in my life. It was so chilling that I don't guess I'll ever forget it. I was in Jerusalem. Francis was with me. Dr. Lewis, that's here tonight. That's the senior pastor of our church in Baton Rouge, along with his wife, Ruth, were with us also in Jerusalem. And with a very capable guide, we crossed a little hill and went down into a valley. And the guide, perfectly trained, said, Brother Swaggart, this is the traditional place where Judas Iscariot hung himself, committed suicide, died. We walked down into what was anciently known as the Valley of Hinnom. 
Years and years and ages of antiquity passed. It was the garbage dump for the city of Jerusalem. Greasy smoke would wind its way toward the heavens for hundreds of years, says the refuse. The carcasses of dead animals were thrown into the valley of Hinnon. The sewage ran into this area. The odor would touch the edge of Jerusalem. For so long, so long, the garbage was piled there, and this is where Judas went after he left the Last Supper. Committed his heinous deed, did this thing that would cause unmitigated hell, for himself forever and forever. Maybe in the annals of human history, maybe in humanity's dealings with God and his fellow man, maybe to the dawn of time and man's cry to reach an august God, maybe of all the black wretched, horrible deeds committed that would cause us to be shocked into insensibility. None was ever more horrid than this deed committed this night. Maybe there will never be a black stain as black as that. Maybe heaven will ever recoil at the shock. Maybe only the blood of Jesus would ever remove that dark stain that corrupted all of humanity carried out by the hand of Judas. It was so terrible. It was so numbing. It was so mind-shocking. It, it so wrenched his insides out until when the deed was done, he went back to the priest that had given him the 30 pieces of silver. 30 pieces of silver, just the price of a slave. 30 pieces of silver, the price they paid. And my heart I have given to this Christ betrayed. 30 pieces of silver the price of a slave. Against a man that had never done any wrong, a statement that could never be uttered about any human being that ever walked on the face of the earth. Who could sing as David of old sang? The sweet singer of Israel that plucked the golden tones of the melodious harp but David was stained with adultery and even murder. Who could stand in the shadow of a big fisherman, rough and crude, but yet mighty in God? Simon Peter. But yet he was flawed. Who could weep as a Jeremiah? Who could prophesy as an Isaiah? But all of mankind has been flawed and stained except that one, the son of David. Never an unkind word. When I think of it, I, 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 I shudder inside. I, I love my God. I, I, I would die for him, I believe, if I had to do it. But when I think of Perfection, Jimmy Swaggart, I, I, I choke on the word. I, I, I cannot get it out. I, I see the flaws, the inconsistencies, the, the short, brackish words, the unkindness at times, uh, 
the, the failure, I see it. I see it. But Jesus was the epitome of love. Only evil could kill him. He cried, I betrayed innocent blood. Satan had so entered Judas, he couldn't stop now. If he had only turned and run, run to Jesus, and as the master would stagger that Via Dolorosa and threw himself at the master's feet, Jesus, I believe with all of my heart, would have forgiven him and cleansed him and washed him. But you can go so far into sin until as millions watch me right now, you, don't, you no longer want the highballs and the, 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 the shot glasses full of liquor. You no longer want the wine and the champagne. You no longer want the parties and the drugs and the bennies and to snort your coke and to push the rusty needle in your vein. You don't want it anymore, but you can't stop. That's hell. This is not a game of tiddlywinks we're playing. It's not a game of dandelions or picking or plucking roses from the stem. This, this is a matter of life or death. This is a matter of eternity and you can go so far that you may want to stop. You may want to turn around, but you can't quit. You hear me? You hear me tonight watching me by television. You listen to Jimmy Swaggart. I, I speak not condemnatorily to you. I speak not sarcastically to you. I, I take this book and I, I, I use it not as a bludgeon but as love. You can't quit. You can't stop. You want to quit but you cannot any longer. You're like Judas. It's nothing but a headlong plunge into destruction. And that's hell. That's hell like no human being would know it. And he went to this place, the Valley of Hinnon. He takes a rope in the most agonizing horror that the human mind could ever grasp, puts it around his neck, and he cannot stand it anymore. What he has done, it's too deep. He can't live. He cannot stand it. It's impossible. That's hell when you get there. And he, I looked up at that cliff, that precipice, that tradition says that he threw himself off of. I looked up and I imagined for a moment what it was like if such a thing could be. You may not understand, you may not believe even what I'm about to say to you, but I sense something there. I, I felt something, it was, it was like a coldness that gripped me. For a few moments, there was, there was the horrid, icy feeling of eternity lost without God. And when he jumps off the cliff to take his life, to get out of this unmitigated hell, but he will not get out of it. He will stay in it forever. In the first chapter of the book of Acts, the, the great Dr. Luke writing this summary as the Holy Spirit gave it to him implies that something happened when he did this. There is an implication in that first chapter of Luke that that it was more than just suicide. Lightfoot, the great historian, said that Satan strangled him. Strangled him and picked him up and threw him down on the rocks. And his bowels gushed out. 
as these thoughts were going through my mind. I looked down, and Dr. Lewis said, Brother Swaggart, look at your feet. A ditch was there, sewage, raw sewage, nearly a foot deep, was crawling with its odor slowly at my feet down that valley of Hinnom. It was as if though God had said, it will ever be that which he represented and did. I've never felt in my life like I felt that, that day. Never. I wept. I couldn't help it. I wept. I weep every time I think of it. Leave the scene. Go back to better days. Days of the greatest moment earth had ever known to that time. Jesus is choosing his disciples. I don't know what he looked like. There is no record, and the Bible did it, God did it for a reason, of what his appearance was like. No record, Jesus. But I have the right to believe what he must have been like. I do not know how tall he might have been. I do not know if his face would have been considered handsome or striking. I do not know that. But I do know there was a commanding power about his personality. I know that when he walked, men stood in awe of him. I know that even his disciples, after they were chosen, oftentimes would not approach him because this one was different. No wonder. Every funeral this book records that he encountered, he changed it. Hallelujah. Glory to God. He raised the dead to life. He touched blinded eyes. They instantly opened lame legs. They were made to walk. He blesses five loaves and two fishes and they feed 5,000 men beside the women and the children. He walks on the water. He's the blind man healer, the leper cleansing man from Galilee. Hallelujah to the Lamb. I'm not talking about some mortal. I'm not talking about some Hollywood production. I'm not talking about some Greek. God. I'm talking about the son of the living God that came and walked among men, took upon himself mortal flesh and looked the devil in the eye and never failed or sinned one single time. Glory to God and the Lamb forever. <laughs> Hallelujah. Commanding. He prayed all night before he chose his disciples. The crude fisherman that the book said was ignorant and unlearned, Peter, James, John, sons of Zebedee, Andrew, Peter's brother, Matthew, the corrupt tax collector, hated by his own people, sitting at the receipt of custom, taker of tax for the hated Roman juggernaut Matthew one day Jesus said Matthew follow me hallelujah Matthew left that receipt of custom stepped out into eternity eternity that would never end eternity of glory wrote the first book in the new covenant glory be to the lamb what are you saying? I'm saying if you'll follow Jesus, you'll never regret it. If you'll follow Jesus, it'll be a life you'll never regret. If you'll follow Jesus, it's a life eternal. <laughs> Judas was one of these he called. He chose. What an honor. 
That this has always intrigued me. I've, I've studied it, I've studied it, I've studied it. Those two words, follow me. In the Greek, it means immediately. Leave your fishing business, leave your tax collecting, leave everything. Right now, this moment, don't wait, don't go home and follow me. And the Bible said they walked out and left it all and said, we're going with you, Jesus. We're going with you. That's the only way. No other way. Some of you might say, well, if I can do this or I'll do that or I can do this, I'll make plenty of money first. I'll forget that. Follow Jesus. Immediately step out and follow him. The only way. No other way. Jesus. This is intriguing. And then he chose Judas. Before knowledge, he knew what would happen, but it was not demanded. God did not engineer or orchestrate this narrative of eternity. Judas did that. The call. There is nothing that's any more holy than the call of God. I know what I'm talking about. I have no, no scriptural proof of it. I have no personal proof of it. And I say this with every iota of humility that I would ever know if I know anything about humility. But I, I believe with all of my heart that God called me before I was born. I believe that. I'll always believe it. Whether it's true or not, God's not told me that, but I believe it in my spirit. I believe before I was born, He called me to do what I'm doing. I know when I was eight years of age, the tender age of eight, I remember it like it was stamped indelibly imprinted upon the recesses of my mind. I'll never forget it. God called me to be an evangelist. God placed that call within my heart and within my life. You are not tonight looking at a professional evangelist. You're looking at a man that God laid his hand upon and woe be unto me if I preach not the gospel of God. I know what that call is. It burns in my heart 24 hours a day. The, the, the cry for souls, the, 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 the terrible agonies of eternity without God. Night after night I will awaken the hot tears at 2, 3 a.m. in the morning will roll down my cheeks and I will cry, God, I can't do it. I am too frail. I cannot do it what you ask of me to do. Why do you say that, Jimmy Swagger? Why would any human being say such a thing? Why would you say if God has laid his hand on you and called you? I'll tell you why. You may never understand it. These ministers of the Gospels the gospel understands it. The closer you get to God, and I know that there is so much distance I have to cover in this area, but the more He calls you, the greater the powers of hell fights. I, I cannot tell you, there's no way I can convey it to you. Even my own wife that I love more than my life does not know nor understand nor cannot know nor understand the, the, the tremendous battle that goes on in your soul. The, the, the forces of darkness that, 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 that seems to stand with all the battletons of hell lined in array and says you will not do it. You cannot do it. I know that you cannot understand that. I, I know, and I don't expect you to. The agony of, of all my face when I said, God, I can't stand it anymore. The television ministry. Two years ago, three years ago, I can't do it. Turned my face to the wall and said, God, please, I can't do it. The mortal mind would say, what do you mean? Anyone would want to do this. You say that you do not understand what you're talking about. The powers of hell so severe, the oppressive towers of darkness, 
And the Holy Spirit spoke to my heart as surely as I stand here and said, Son, I have called you to do this. I have asked you to do it. There are few that I can get to do it. But if you won't do it, I will look elsewhere. And he broke my heart. And I said, God, I'll, I'll do what I can. I know what the call is. What are you saying? I'm, I'm saying that, that eternal souls, these pastors will understand it. I'm saying that bringing them out of the wretches of hell, it, it's not a cold, scientific, educational process. It is an agony of the Spirit. It is an agony when the child of Almighty God must go to the very gates of hell to plead the souls of those people that they cry for. I know what the call is. I know. Judas had that call. I remember as a child, eight years old, nine years old, taking a little Bible, going out to a cope of woods in back of our house. I'd made a prayer altar out of a log. Hour after hour, day after day, week after week, I would drape over that log and cry to God. Eight years old, nine years old. Plead, cry, weep. As his call was in my heart and in my life. Judas had that same call. And I want to tell you something. It may be in a different or a lesser way. But every person that hears the gospel is called. Called to follow Jesus, to live for God. You that watch me by television, I weep over you. I see you. I see you when I'm asleep. I see you when I stand here by faith. I see you. I know the battle that you fight in your soul, the agony that, that flows deep in your spirit. I know the terrible conflict. I know. I know that you're called. I know some of you that sit in a hovel, be it in the Philippines or be it in the great country of Brazil or, or, or Canada or over the United States or Central America or South America or Africa or wherever it is. And the Holy Spirit, through the power of the anointing, reaches through that television set and touches your heart. You are called. Never forget it. Called of God. It's a holy thing. You won't shake it off. Mister, some of you that watch this telecast, you have cursed this evangelist. You have laughed. You have made your fun. Your wife has constantly cried to God for your soul. But in spite of everything devils, demons, and hell can do, you're getting closer and closer and closer to Jesus Christ because you're cold and you're coming home. Oh. Judas was called. I want you to look at his character now. You see, just because God calls a person, it doesn't mean that He will force them to do that which is right. He won't make you, mister, get saved. That's your choice. It's got to be that way. He won't make you, young lady, quit your dialects with the world of Flesh, lust, carnality, good times, bright lights, fast living. He won't make you stop that. You can keep going if you want to. It's up to you. But it'll damn your soul. Judas was flawed. Never mind. Peter was too. James and John. The sons of Zebedee, they were flawed also. They had terrible problems. God is not dealing with perfect people. 
He's in the salvage business. You hear me? Thank God he is. Thank God he is. Thank God he is. He can take the broken pieces, put them together with his love, and make something out of it. Thank God he's in the salvage business. Thank God he can take the wrecks of dredges of humanity and make something of you. He had problems. I'm going to say something that will shock you. In Psalms 109, and 17, don't bother to look at it now, but you can look at it when you get home. It says that he loved cursing. This is a double prophecy here, a double statement applying to Ahithophel and to Judas. I want to say that again. He loved cursing. Now, this word is not necessarily referring to profanity, as you and I know of profanity today. Its broader meaning speaks of, how can I put it? What we would refer to today as the bright lights. What we would refer to today as the world. It's a better term. He loved the world. That's your problem. That's everybody's problem because the world is exciting. Just as the glistening skin of a rattlesnake and its eyes are exciting, the world is exciting. Satan has honed his work down to a razor edge. The bright lights, the, 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 the fast women, the, 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 the liquor, the alcohol, the drugs, the, the money, the booze, the, the excitement, the good time, the, 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 the dilance with the opposite sex, the whole thing, the world. It's exciting. It has an allurement to it. Every one of these musicians that stand here tonight, these singers, I've, I've prayed them in. I've, I've wept, I've sobbed, I've cried to God to, to pray them in. God sent them and God would pluck one here and there because, listen to Jimmy Swaggart, it is almost impossible to get singers and musicians that live for God. We have them the best in the world that say we'd love to be with you, but we know you won't put up with what we do. And the way we live. I've prayed these in. I've sobbed them in. I've cried them in. I've fasted them in. I watch over them. I, 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 everything they do, it's, it's a call of God. They're young. They, they don't quite understand what I'm talking about tonight. They will later. Very much so. They understand it somewhat. But the world is attractive. I mean, it's attractive, friend, with eyes staring. The women are beautiful. The lights are bright. The drum rolls. And the talent and the ability and the charisma and the personality screams for carnal release. You see what I'm talking about? It's there. The thirst for power, money. He loved cursing. He loved that which the world relished. And then there was money. He liked money. He wanted money. He carried the bag. He was the treasure and he was stealing from it. And he wanted power. The youth scream for the bright lights. The world screams for money. And a few thirst for power. They want that power, and Judas wanted it. And I'm going to tell you how he wanted it. 
It is the age-old problem of humanity. They will trade off with God. Some of you are doing it right now. I'll tell you how. He fought a battle in his soul and spirit, Judas did. It was a battle that never ended. He is shoulder to shoulder with his familiar friend. He, he is anointed by Jesus, sent out to heal the sick and cast out devils. For a moment, he catches the, 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 the might and the majesty of authority and power. But he doesn't see it as God intends for it to be seen. And this is one of the, the sins of the church. What I'm about to say is Jesus said the, the, the dough, the, the, the ingredient that the bread is made out of. Little by little, leaven is put in it. Leaven is, is that which they use like yeast to make beer to make alcoholic beverage it corrupts it's all it always speaks of rottenness of corruption it's what alcoholic beverage is made out of he said the ingredient is little by little in, entrusted with with leaven until it is totally corrupted all of the ingredient all of the bread all of the dough all of the the church is corrupted Say that's a terrible statement. I didn't say it. He did. Organized religion is totally corrupted. Be that sound sarcastic or, or condemnatorial, I, I cannot help it. I'm not speaking of belonging to a denomination. Don't misunderstand me. I'm talking about the basic of organized religion, it's been inserted, corrupted, because it wants earthly power. You hear me? And the church of Jesus Christ is to be what that young lady sang about tonight. Holy Spirit, touch through me. That's it. The church of Jesus Christ, the body of Christ, Judas never understood this. He saw power. He wanted to control men. Religion wants to control men. Control your thinking. Control your lives. Control your actions. Some of you sit here tonight and you say, Jimmy Swaggart, I, I don't like too much what you're saying. Some of you by television, you have gotten the drift of my thought that I give to you. You're saying you bother me with what you say. I cannot help that. I want to bother you. I desire to bother you. The religious system, per se, of the world today is corrupted with leaven. It's evil. It's wicked. Because of the same problem Judas Iscariot had. He saw the power. He saw Jesus not as the Lamb of God taketh away the sin of the world. He saw Jesus as a means to an end. And Jesus Christ is big business today. If you don't believe it, you look at the pomp and the fall to roll of organized religion. It's big business. But Jesus is a means to an end in this corrupt living. Judas didn't understand that if you lived, you would have to die. He didn't understand that you would have to enter into the Master's sufferings. He didn't understand the cross. He didn't understand it. He only saw the power. 
And this was his thought. There is scriptural tinge that this was his mind. Now listen carefully to me. Jesus would, with his power, to change water to wine, to feed thousands with a little fish and a little bread, to raise the dead. He would unseat the Roman power. He would, he would make Caesar tremble. Jesus would restore Israel to her place in the sun. And he, Judas, would be big in this earthly kingdom. He, Judas, would be powerful. He, Judas, would be glorious. He would be powerful. There was no limit to what he could do. He grew impatient for Jesus to do this. And when it seemed like that he would not do it. Judas would force the issue. He would place Jesus Christ in a position, never even remotely understanding the cross or why Jesus was to die or why he came. He didn't even remotely understand that. If he really is the Son of God, if he really is the Messiah, it'll be no problem for him to roll back those Roman guards, to exert his authority. Maybe it will force the issue and he will have to take action. And if he cannot do it, then I've gained 30 pieces of silver. Some of you right now, you bargain with God. I will play my hand, and at the last breath, I'll ask God to forgive me. I will take my chances, preacher. I will do it my way. There isn't but one way, and that's God. As I close, look at his crying. His calling, his character, and his crying. Betrayal. It's a dirty word. He turned his back upon the only friend, really, he ever had. This was it now. The curtain was about to fall. He's close to Jesus. He will never be closer than this moment. Jesus will take a piece of the bread and reach over and put it into the bowl and sop the bitter herbs, Passover feast. And he will turn and hand it to Judas. This is it. My God, this is it. Angels must have wept. And he took it. In Oriental culture, that was saying to Jesus, I love you. I will stand with you forever. You 
are my friend. I love you. Jesus looked into his eyes. Just as he's looking into your heart. said, what thou doest, do it, do it quickly. The Bible said he went out, and it was night. The Bible says something else that most people do not know. Judas had a family. Wife, children. His children, the children of a betrayer, held their hands out the rest of their life and begged, forsaken. Judas Iscariot's children begged until they died. I read it. I read it in the book of Revelation. It's a beautiful passage. And I close with it tonight. Twenty first chapter and fourteenth verse. And the wall of the city had twelve foundations, and in them the names of the twelve apostles of the Lamb. Peter's name is there. Matthew and James and John and Simon Zelotes and Thaddeus. Judas's could have been forever and forever. The son of Kiroth son of Simon. But he went out and it was night. Bow your heads, please. How many in this audience would slip up your hand? Jimmy Swaggart, I'm not living right. I've had opportunity after opportunity, just as Judas did. I walk a crooked path. I'll admit it. I need prayer. I don't want to go to hell. I don't want to be lost. As Judas's name could have been written on one of the foundations of that city built four square. Mine can be written in the Lamb's book of life. Please, I don't want to miss it. How many will lift that hand? Pray for me. I'm not living right. Pray for me. They're on this main floor, raise them quickly. I'm talking to young and old, mother and dad alike. Slip it up. I see the many, many hands. God bless your heart. Thank you so much. Thank you. Up in the first tier of seats, how many will raise your hands? There's a man, others, raise them up quickly. The tier of seats, I see them there as I make the circle. Hands are going up. Thank you. At the back, the tier of seats at the back, how many more would slip up your hands? Thank you. Right hand side, pray for me, I'm not living right. Up in the bleachers, way at the back, all the way around, raise your hands. I'm going to make the circle. I see them. Thank God they're going up way at the back against the wall. Thank you so much. How many more? How many more? Keep raising them. I see them. God love your heart. Keep raising them. 
Keep raising them as the Spirit of God moves. Thank you so much. I'm going to ask Dwayne and the team to sing that song that Charlie's been playing. There's room at the cross for you. And as they sing it, I want everyone to stand, please. Everybody standing over this audience, please. The Spirit of a holy God moving. I'm going to ask every person in this building that raised your hand, whomever you may be, wherever you are standing, I want you to come. I want you to stand right down here. I don't want you to do what Judas did. You can walk out that door and it is night. Or you can come up to the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, Jesus Christ. I want to say that again. You can say no to God and walk out that door and it is night. Or you can walk up here and say yes to Jesus. The same opportunity given to Judas is given to you. I want you to come as they sing it this moment. Come, please. There's room at the cross for you. There's room at the cross for you. Come on. Yes, there's room at the cross for you. Sing it again, Dwayne. Sing it again. There's room, he said. There's room there was room for Judas. There's room for you. Yes, there's room. And